and then there is no question in my mind now that the individual who's con done this crime knew exactly what they were doing in terms of that house. And then I'm, I'm going to go with 100%. They're very familiar with that particular piece of property. They have crossed the individuals within that property at some point. I guarantee it. Okay, so that was the general consensus also when we all watched this, that, you know, the docs, you guys all felt, okay, Greg, you felt, Dean, you felt, yep, you, you're of the same opinion that there is a crossover here, okay? So now we know post 10 days after the murder and his arrest now, that there's a high probability of that kind of information being revealed. Okay. So Gary, let's kick it off with prototype. You have all, you've been the one who has coined that terminology. Uh, break that down for us, and uh, we'll start from there and get into voyeurism. So this construct of fantasy focusing on a figure that reminds you of previous individuals that have hurt you or that you've sort of brought together into a mass of people in your mind that you want to hurt through that individual is one that was identified decades ago in the research that was done with people like Ann and Greg and, you know, and Dean that have talked to people that have committed serial homicide, uh, particularly serial sexual homicide. Um, but it sort of didn't have a word, you know, to apply to it. So I started calling it the prototype. And the prototype essentially means um, who is the first person that did that to you, that left you feeling that there was a playing field that needed to be leveled. And then you go out, as I said, on Dateline, like a casting agent to find someone that looks the part, right? That, that will allow for a perfect enactment of fantasy. And of course, uh, no one is ever going to perfectly fit the fantasy. And you're left with an individual that needs to go out and keep hunting and prowling other people to play the role until it is perfected and lived out over and over. So that in a sense, with certain people, for example, of the Ted Bundy variety, um, you could really say that they're killing one person over and over again, as opposed to killing many people, right? So that, that in, a, in a kind of symbolic, emblematic way, someone is a scapegoat for some other individual. And, um, you know, for example, in the Bundy case, we know that it was a girlfriend that had lent him a kind of a validity, a sense of belonging, because she was so attractive and popular and all that. And when she abandoned him, she left him feeling that he was a nothing, a nobody. And the victim started to look an awful lot like her, parted hair, you know, parted down the middle, long hair, etc. And um, what's interesting in this Koberger case is if you start looking at the women who were killed and you look at the woman that he went on a date with on Tinder back at the time they went on the Tinder date and there was a sort of weird tickling incident or whatever that was about. Um, and we start looking at, you know, um, uh, the, the woman who supposedly there was some interest in at school, etc. You wind up seeing that they kind of look alike. And I, that's very interesting to me. I mean, I think, you know, for all of us, attraction has a quality of the prototype. I mean, you know, I always say there's no such thing as love at first sight. There's love at second sight because you meet the person who most looks like your fantasy that you've always had. Right. And, and that's based on something, you know, did you love a certain relative very much? Was it your first crush? Was it the, the person? So this is like a perverted version of that where you go out looking for the person that you loathe the most to take out all of that hostility on. So my question is to follow up on Gary's is did he, he had the fantasy. I absolutely agree with that. Um, what the, the, the prototype, so to speak, but he maybe hadn't found it yet. Um, and so part of the time that he's out there is looking for that person or persons, as we know in this case. And there is some talk from, from uh, what we already know that two of the young women worked at one of the restaurants and so forth. So he could have plenty of opportunity over the months that he was out there to get the, his prototype. And that he had actually three of them that had a had pretty similar looking. 
uh, I think tells us that they're all very attractive, they're blonde, they're smiling, they're very happy, that, that kind of thing. He'd certainly pick three. I, I'm, I always think that the, bo the young man was not necessarily to be part of the, well, we don't know, part of the fantasy, but he was there uh, that night. So he comes back. He could play out his fantasy several times. I uh, Greg, bring, bringing that uh, to a point, you mentioned uh, when you learned that he had set up uh, some cameras uh, for one of his uh, female colleagues, our student that he went to college with. Uh, break that down for us. What's your thought process on that? Because you were talking about the extensive voyeurism um, aspect of this guy that we would find. Sure. Um, let me just uh, affirm, of course, by my uh, support of what's been said uh, by both Ann and Gary, and, and uh, I agree with everything that they've said. I, I find it really uh, intriguing about this concept of the prototype. Um, in a, if we were to apply that from a profiling jargon, if you will, the, the type of verbiage we might use was that the victims particularly of serial offenders. And there's no doubt in my mind that this individual, uh, whoever committed this crime, uh, this was not going to be a one and done type of a, a case. That there would have been many more in the future had he been, if, if he is successful. Um, but the, the prototype, we would refer to that probably more from a perspective of their symbolic, symbolic of the prototype, as Gary has mentioned so that these future victims would be symbolic of this individual uh, that becomes a substitute victim, if you will, for that individual that uh, they hold such, such a degree of animosity and hate for um, and a desire to punish in, in for one reason or another. Um, so I, I certainly agree with that and, and uh, believe that any future victims of this particular offender and at this point, as you've already pointed out, that uh, he's innocent until proven guilty. But whoever is responsible for this, <clears throat> no doubt uh, that there would be future victims. And, and that any victims that uh, this individual had in mind, potential symbolic victims, uh, if he has selected them, are going to have similar types of characteristics uh, of of the victims that we see uh, represented there that night, and um, they're very vivacious. They're beautiful young ladies. Socially, they're very <clears throat> uh, adept, obviously, and very popular. Uh, well liked, have lots of friends, um, and attract a lot of positive attention. And they represent that group of victims that are so far far extended from the offender's belief in themselves as to being acceptable by that group, uh, that that animosity bleeds over, so to speak, into um, anybody that represents that, that social type of victim or that prototype, whoever that was in the background of their lives or how many there may have been. It may have been more than one, uh, but they're consistent and represent something that's far beyond his reach. And, and he doesn't have a, a sense of confidence uh, to be able to be attractive to the, that type of person. And uh, in a sense, confirm their, his own level of self-esteem. In fact, he confirms his lack of self-esteem lack of uh, personal uh, appreciation for what he wants, but he can't have it. His fantasy is far beyond that which he'll ever experience himself. And so, as Gary has, has pointed out, those people become their, uh, and anyone that represents them becomes potential, potential candidates as victims. 